Well, Ken, I want to speak with you a little bit about the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Luke. I'm pleased that you have uh, found time to be with me. I consider you to be one of the great assets to our diocese, uh, a man who knows the Scriptures, who's studied them, and is willing and generous with your time to teach classes and to make yourself available uh, throughout our diocese. So much appreciated for the opportunity to speak with you about Luke's Gospel. When I say Luke, uh, we could put that in a triad, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We say they form the Synoptic Gospels. I think it goes back to 1776 when a, a scholar by the name of Griesbach, if I remember correctly, uh, figured out that these three Gospels were very much the same and began a certain modern approach to studying them in parallel columns so that if you put them side by side, you begin to see how they are the same in many ways, even word for word often, and yet have dramatic differences in them. So that has become the synoptic question that scholars have worked with throughout uh, modern times. How do you figure out this similarity, and what do the differences mean? Yeah, that's very correct. The, uh, the synoptic problem is how they can be simultaneously so similar and yet so different. Uh, the, uh, the fact that there's only something like 80 verses of Mark's gospel that, is not, that are not picked up by either Matthew or Luke or both, uh, the fact that, as you say, sometimes they are word for word the same. When, when you think that Jesus spoke in Aramaic, and there's, when you know languages, you know that you can translate the same uh, sentence in one language by a number of different ways in another language. When you have uh, works written in Greek, a different language, and yet they're word for word the same in treating the sayings of Jesus or even the narrative accounts, there can be only one uh, right. you cannot for this. You cannot believe that this is just done orally That's or right. by chance. So one other option is that God has dictated the three Gospels and that each one is a, nothing but a stenographer uh, like functioning like a dictating machine, um, so that uh, if you rule that out, then you're down to one possibility, that is they're working with one written text, a Greek text. That's, uh, I always appreciate this, Occam's razor. If there's two explanations for an event, one of which requires a miracle, and the other which can be ex okay. is, just relies on natural explanations, you always have to go with the natural with explanation the natural rather than one, right. presuming there's a miracle involved. Right. And so here we've got uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke looking very similar, and the, the common explanation would be that Mark wrote first around the year 69 using many oral sources, pulling them together in his own distinctive gospel, somewhere uh, probably writing in Rome and using a theology very close to that of Paul's. And then uh, when both Matthew and Luke wrote in different settings themselves, they would have had Mark in front of them, made use of that written gospel. That's what accounts for some of the similarities. But then we got this other odd factor that Luke has material exactly as Matthew has it and uh, not found in Mark. And again, you get a lot of word-for-word -word, uh, uh, similarities here indicating another written source, which we often call the Q document. And then each one would have their own distinctive theology and their own other distinctive sources that they use as well. So that is commonly called the two-source theory and is the sort of standard explanation of how we end up with this uh, gospel parallels. Incidentally, I mean, people would want to look at that. I'm just holding a book here, Gospel Parallels, a synopsis of the first three gospels by Burton Throckmorton. And uh, that would be one, I suppose, one of the standard books where you could actually get in and look at it. Throckmorton is the uh, author. Thomas Nelson is the publisher. publisher. And it's uh, it commonly, if you ask in a bookstore for a gospel parallel or a gospel harmony is one way of finding these things. But it is fascinating. I often have students, like in our RCIA program, when I'm trying to teach Christology to them, and, and I'll just Xerox a couple pages out of uh, this book and show them so they can actually look and see how they're the same, and then there'll be parts left out, parts added, words changed, and uh, you begin to understand that each of these authors, it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very distinctive characters, and they are, they're, they are theologians in a sense that they are giving us their distinctive outlook on these Gospels. I, I would uh, certainly subscribe to what you said there. I'd recommend Frank Morton's book very highly. Um, it's, uh, a harmony is a different thing. Maybe the, your, your listeners might mm. want to make sure they don't get a harmony. A gospel harmony is it really goes does violence to what the gospels are. It tries to to harmonize them, to remove all that's distinctive about the gospels, and make them all 
put them into a meat grinder, make sausage out of them. Uh, but what the, the as the, the uh, synopsis of a gospel, as you were describing there, is I always tell my students that you cannot really study the, the gospels without a, or at least it's very difficult to study the gospel without a synopsis. And what that does, and maybe and that kind of moves right into what are we want to talk about, particularly in this program, is that it highlights, uh, it um, is extremely helpful for what we call redaction criticism, a way of studying the Gospels that pays very close attention to how each Gospel writer, each evangelist, takes these common stories and adapts them in such a way that they make the point that that particular evangelist thought that his community needed to be reminded of, needed to keep firmly in mind. When you can see the, the subtle uh, changes that Matthew and Luke make in Mark's uh, statements, you can see, um, you can, you, by reading between the lines there, you can see very clearly what they're trying to accomplish in writing what they do. Yes, and that, even even a, an unskilled person, since yes, without Bill yes. back on, if you just read it carefully and look at what change they made, you can begin to get a picture. One way, a good way of doing that, I think, is to ask yourself, what picture of Jesus emerges in each of the Gospels? Yes, so, for yes. example, if you read Mark, you start, you know, all this emphasis on the cross and the hidden Messiah and the disciples not understanding him. And uh, the, the Satan figures uh, are, do know who he is and so on. You begin to get a picture of Jesus as the hidden Messiah, the suffering one, the one that must go to the cross. You read Matthew and you, you, you say, well, my heavens, it's constant. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. The Hebrew scriptures come alive in Jesus. He's the new Moses, the new David, the new Israel. He's a rabbi who teaches. He cuts mm. down on Mark's narrative section to make more mm. room for the teaching of Jesus. And now that will take us uh, more particularly here to Luke. Luke. And what I'd like you to do, Ken, is you, you do so well, is to give us some of the historical critical approach to this. That is, let's say a little about what we know who, who Luke was, when he wrote, and, and what setting he wrote in, uh, what his community was about. And then I want to look at it from a literary viewpoint as well. But let's sure. first get that setting here for Luke's Gospel. I think what we find in the New Testament itself matches very closely with what we are also told by the various sources from tradition, various uh, writers from that very early period, that Luke was a Gentile, that he was um, converted by Paul, and therefore did not hear Jesus directly, but uh, in fact he was not even converted by someone who heard Jesus directly, but he's more or less like we are, uh, someone who gets the faith uh, third hand. Uh, though ironically, it's maybe a paradox by page count, he actually writes more of the New Testament than anybody else, as someone had said. That's because he wrote two volumes. Two volumes. He wrote Luke the next thing to and say. Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah. He begins uh, act, volume one, the Gospel, by a, a dedication to Theophilus, and then he begins Acts, volume two, by speaking about, in my former volume, oh, Theophilus, I said such and so, and now he can, picks up the story there. Let's, let's look at the uniqueness of this, because yes. so many of the other authors are shaped by a Jewish mentality. I yes. mean, Paul, clearly, a Pharisaic background and, and all of that, Jewish categories. Matthew, steeped in the Jewish law, maybe perhaps a rabbi himself who was excommunicated from the community. Mark, working out of Jewish categories, Aramaic, his first language. John, in all the Johannine school, uh, filled with the Jewish thought. Um, so, I mean, you know, we're getting <laughs> Luke here, we're saying, here's a Gentile yes. writing. So we have a certain uh, uniqueness about Luke here. You see it in, again, once you, once maybe you've, it's been pointed out to you, and you just look, if, if any of our listeners would look at a synopsis, you can see it uh, practically page after every page. You'll find, for example, that Mark frequently quotes the exact words that Jesus would use. when He, he holds the, uh, stretches out his hand to the little girl and says, Talitha kum, little girl arise. Mark gives both the Aramaic, which is what Jesus would have said, and then gives a Greek translation because the people for whom he's writing don't understand Greek. When Luke gets to that, he always they, they drops don't under, out the They Aramaic. don't understand Aramaic. That's right. So no Luke's audience doesn't understand Aramaic. That's right. Is what you want to so say. he always leaves that out. Right. He, he will remove anything in his picture of Jesus that would be misunderstood by his uh, congregation. For example, uh, the story that otherwise we think would have appealed to Luke very much, the story where G the Syrophoenician woman follows after Jesus and asks him to cure his da her daughter, and Jesus has the uh, the line that he wasn't sent to, to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. it's not right to take the food of children and give it to the dogs, and she comes back with that clever repartee, yes, but even the dogs get to eat the, the food that the kids don't want, the leftovers that falls from the table. Um, and Jesus is so impressive, he says, well, for that kind of an answer, I will do what you ask me to do. Well, Luke omits it because... Well, we're quite sure it's because the implication is that the Gentiles are dogs. dogs well, right. that's not going to be You just can't have a gospel you're giving to the Gentiles that's calling them dogs, and they that's would right. recognize that. 
and they're going to turn it off because uh, part of what we're doing in Gospels is preaching and right. finding a tool to spread uh, Christianity. You see, in another way, um, you were talking about the uh, the picture of Jesus that's painted by each of the Gospels. In, in the case of Luke, it's a picture of Jesus as the compassionate man, the one who is concerned about the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden, people who have a hard road to hoe in society. Mm -hmm. Much attention to Jesus' uh, attention to Samaritans and, uh, and women and soldiers and lepers and outcasts and so on. Um, and in But in doing that, well, a very appealing picture, for example, when Luke... Uh, gives the stories and Mark gives about that ha show, have Jesus showing some emotion. For example, that he puts his arms around the little kids when he blesses them, or when Mark says that he looked on the young man with love and told him to sell everything he has and so forth. Luke will omit those details. And, and the reason is because in, in the Greek philosophy of the time, or the, the kind of popular, uh, the, the, the ideas that were in the air, shall we say, not that they belong to any specific school of philosophy, but the ideas in the air were that these, these emotions were, um, were uh, that human beings are supposed to be rational, and that displays of emotion were something a step down. Mark, as a Jew, has no problem with, with showing Jesus, having Jesus show emotion, mm -hmm. but Luke knows that's going to be misunderstood by his group, so he just omits those Omits those the stories about Jesus as, uh, that would show his emotional involvement right. in what is going on. It's really important for people to, in reading go the Gospels to keep that kind of thing in mind, I think. That's right. Um, Mark, th another example from the Passion Narrative, uh, we're just, uh, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus on the cross prays the, the psalm, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, a Jewish audience knows that, that if you just take that line by itself, that sounds pretty bad. It sounds like Jesus has lost his faith. When you know the whole psalm, you know that it starts out about how terribly this man is suffering, and yet the psalm concludes with this triumphant uh, declaration of that nonetheless, nevertheless, despite of all these things happening, his faith in God remains secure. Luke, who's writing for Gentiles, can't be sure that they will know that whole psalm, and so he uses the psalm, um, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, as the statement uh, on the cross, okay. a different, Psalm 31, I think it is, um, a different psalm, that, but which in the one line quoted contains that statement of confidence mm -hmm. already, because his, con his right. congregation is not going to be able to, he can't count at least. The, on them know the knowing psalm. that Psalm 22, after Father, why have you forsaken me, ends up with a, on a That's more correct. hopeful note. That's correct. So he's writing for a, for a Gentile audience. He is a Gentile, writing for a Gentile audience. Um, I usually date the gospel about the time of Matthew. That That's is right. in the middle 80s. That's correct. How about a place? We've got Mark writing in Rome, and we've got Matthew writing in uh, Antioch. Right? That's correct. And then where are we going to place Luke here? From the Gospel itself, all we could say would be some Gentile setting. Uh, there are no clues in the Gospel itself that would pinpoint it. Tradition uh, says that he, did, he wrote it in what we today would call Greece, Achaia. Uh, but uh, the tradition does not uh, specify any specific uh, city uh, for him. We know that, uh, that he was connected with Philippi for many years, uh, Luke was. But uh, whether he wrote it there or not, we, we can't really be that certain. That's where Paul founded the first community that's within correct. a sort of European side. One of right? the things that's notable about the Acts of the Apostles are the we sections where, where Luke will be writing and saying that Paul and Barnabas, they went here and they did this and they did that and then all of a sudden it will say and then we crossed over and we went here and we did this. One of those, the first we section begins on the, on what we today would call the Turkey side of the Straits, goes to Philippi and then switches, the we section stops and goes into the they did this and this, until the group comes back through Philippi on the way east again, and all of a sudden the we section picks <laughs> up again. The implication again. being that Luke uh, dropped off at, in Philippi and continued to work in Philippi while mm -hmm. Paul and the others moved on from there. Interesting. Uh, what, one of the ways we approach the scriptures these days, besides this historical critical method, which helps us, as you well pointed out, to, to locate uh, when, who wrote the gospel, a uh, uh, Gentile in this case, um, and uh, writing it for Gentiles, um, and writing in maybe the little middle 80s, and knowing Mark and Q and so on, as we said, is, is to look at it from a literary viewpoint. And one of the things that um, is a, one of the authors, John Drury, um, writes well in this. It's a literary guide to the Bible, edited by Robert Alter and Frank Kermode very helpful book, uh, looks at the Gospels in a very different way. And one of the things you see 
uh, in Luke's gospel is that he's, as some of the authors say, a master of the long view. He's got a big perspective. He wants to hold the story together. He wants to make sure that it's a continuous narrative. It fits very much what we would call the modern mentality, where we have a sense that, well, we're going to make progress, that history is going someplace, that there's an evolution to things, that everything's interconnected in a way. The stark contrast would be with Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel is has discontinuity. It's got interruptions. Things happen, and then Jesus is suddenly in another place, and you don't know exactly how the story really holds together. It's got its high points, uh, Peter's profession of Jesus as the Messiah, and then the centurion saying this is the Son of God. But uh, other than that, it's very... Uh, disconnected in many ways. But you get a whole different feel for reading Luke's gospel. He, he, he keeps giving us clues that things are going to happen later on. I think it's the Transfiguration account. You can uh, uh, correct me on this, but he puts in there some thought of there's going to be the passion uh, and, and so he's sort of beginning to connect already in that moment of triumph or the transfiguration that, yeah, but the passion is coming here later on. And, and so his whole uh, beginning of the gospel seems to set the stage for what's going on later on. And some, one author said the prologue um, has the seeds of all the episodes to come later on. That's why you, I guess we would say his infancy account is the gospel in miniature. That's a phrase I think I took from Raymond Brown, the great Catholic biblical scholar. The, gospel, the infancy account is the gospel in miniature, meaning you can see all the themes in there, and it gets carried out throughout the rest of the gospel. You, you put your finger on a very important point. Uh, we need to take seriously and raise the question, why did Luke think that you couldn't write a gospel by itself but had to include a volume two? It's, and, it, and as he tells uh, Theophilus, that he wants to show Theophilus how reliable this information is that he's been given, that what's going on in the life of the church of Theophilus' day is the same thing that God was doing in the life of Jesus during his ministry. And so one of the ways that he does this is by drawing constant parallels uh, between what happened in the life of Jesus and during the ministry and what happened in the life of the early church. He does it even within the gospel itself. Uh, the as you, I think, maybe were alluding to when you spoke about the prologue. There, that he takes the scene of Jesus' rejection at the synagogue of Nazareth, and moves that up six chapters, well, uh, minus two, four, minus two, four chapters, uh, from where Mark has got it, and and moves it to the very first thing in his gospel. And if you remember that passage, Jesus starts out so well. He shows, he quotes the passage. He reads from the prophet Isaiah shows how he comes to do all these nice things to, to, to bring sight to the blind and release to prisoners and it's a, one of those glorious passages in the prophet Isaiah and tells the people that it's been fulfilled and they're hearing this mm -hmm. day they, um, and things start out real well until he shows an openness to the Gentiles the crowd turns against him and Luke says they take him out of the synagogue bring him to the hill on, mm -hmm. on, the, on which the city was built and try to kill him but he, they can't kill him. He right. passes, through, passes their through their midst. Yeah. And the idea, why would, why would Luke take that scene and put it right at the very beginning, except that it's, it's kind of a parallel parable in miniature for what happened throughout the it entire is. ministry. He started out so well, but then they took him to the hill, Jerusalem, uh, the hill outside I Jerusalem. I noticed how time. you got that slant in there about the Gentiles when he was showing an openness to the Gentiles. That's a, I'm glad you pointed that out, yeah. because in Jesus' career, of course, that was not really the issue. That's in volume two, that's, that's the real right. issue. And yeah. so he's drawing the parallel in the, over the whole. Uh, it shows history. you how the evangelists, too, were pretty free with the material, freer That's than right. we would think a biographer would be today, for example. We wouldn't allow the kind of liberties that uh, the that's evangelists correct. took with the Jesus material. And that's because they were not writing biographies in exactly. a modern sense. They exactly. were giving us documents of faith, and they were trying to, their own theology was governing much of what they were doing. But that's they were right. convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, and uh, he was the, the wisdom of the Father, as Luke would see it, I think. And then they, they're going to tell people about it and find the most effective way of doing it, leaving out things that are going to turn off the audience, trying to play to the things that would help the audience see who Jesus was and would help them to become more fervent followers of him. That you're exactly on the mark. And when you say omit things that were going to be confusing, that is Luke's specific method. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very interesting to see a scene like, for example, uh, when Je this incident about Jesus' brothers and sisters. Um, in Mark's gospel, Mark has this tendency just to call a spade a spade. And so he has uh, the crowds saying, isn't, who is this guy? Isn't Mary his mother? Well, that is, and aren't uh, James and Josie's and the other, his brothers and sisters. The, the polite way of referring to a person in those days was to identify them by means of their father. But Mark identifies Jesus by his mother's name and lets mm -hmm. it hang out there. Matthew 
typically changes Mark's wording. He says, "Isn't isn't uh, he this? Uh, isn't Mary his mother?" Which is different than saying that he's the son of Mary. It's the mm-hmm. polite way of doing it. Luke omits the whole statement about. I mean, okay, that part would say the same. But then the next part about aren't James and Joseph his brothers and sisters? Matthew and Mark, writing for Jewish communities, know that that can that's a much broader term in in Hebrew and Aramaic than simply blood brothers and sisters. They contain that statement. Luke leaves the sentence out because in a Gentile community, brothers means brothers and sisters mean sisters, and so he just drops it because it could be misunderstood. Another example from the uh, the, the account of Jesus' baptisms, baptism, Mark just comes out bluntly and says that John came preaching a baptism for the remission of sins and baptized Jesus. Yeah, sure. Now, the implications of that are not the best, and so we find uh, bo- all the rest of subsequent Gospels trying to fix that up and make sure that's not misunderstood. In Matthew's Gospel, he typically adds material. He has this whole dialogue in the water there where John says, it's not I who baptize you, you should be baptizing me, and Jesus says, no, this, let it go, do it, even though you don't think it's right, it needs to be done this way. All right, then he baptizes him. In Luke's version, what he does is he says, he gives the whole preaching of John the Baptist. He says John the Baptist was then thrown into prison by Herod for preaching against him. And then says, after all the people had been baptized, and Jesus likewise had been baptized and was at prayer, uh, then he had this vision of the Spirit coming upon him. So he manages to tell, to tell the whole story without ever saying in so many words that John was the one who baptized Jesus. He puts in a subordinate clause in the passive voice. It's there, mm-hmm. but the, the wrong impression is not given. And we find him very concerned that people not, that his community, the Gentile right. community, not misunderstand their sources. As we've been talking about the theory, the people for whom he wrote knew these stories as well as we know the stories. What the gospel writers do is they present the stories in such a way that they bring out of them a point that they're afraid that their community may misunderstand or may be forgetting. And so he tells the stories in such a way that they not draw the wrong conclusion from them. Let's go back to this view of Jesus that emerges. Um, we can pick up the compassionate side of Jesus. Yes. That that is for sure. I mean, it's it's there's a great social justice side. People who are interested in social yes. justice these yes. days pick up on Luke four, the very part you were talking about. He preaches the good news to the poor and he liberates the captives. The liberation theologians have picked up on that, and um, so the people who are into social justice often would find that Luke would be their favorite gospel, precisely for that reason. And a great care for the poor and the outcasts. And, and the wonderful stories to bring out uh, that whole thing, the uh, the Good Samaritan story, for example. And then we get that interesting touch, I think, in the agony in the garden. If you look at the, the gospel parallels, you see that there's only one author who ends up saying that Jesus cures the ear of, of the servant uh, whose uh, Peter cuts off his ear. And Luke puts in that interesting little touch of saying, and Jesus cures the man's ears, he heals him. The typical of Luke, uh, of having this compassionate sense of, of how Jesus interacted with people. So there's a very a touching thing, although, as you pointed out, he leaves out the emotion and, and doesn't want to say that. The net effect of the actions and of the stories is to present a God who cares for us, who forgives us all the time. The prodigal son story, right. for example, a uh, marvelous piece uh, showing God's mercy no matter what. The father runs out, throws his arm around the young uh, his son and says, let's have a party. No explanations, nothing, no payback, just let's have a party. And that's how God is. So Luke gives us this you know, forgiveness of compassion, of mercy. And I think for many people, it really is a comforting message. I mean, I, right. I send people to read Luke, for example, who are having guilt feelings, who are feeling scrupulous and, and worried too much about sin. Read chapter 15 of Luke. That's right. Meditate on it and go through it, and, and you'll begin to get a feel for God's mercy. That's right. I, I'd like to pick up on that. The, the, the picture that he portrays of Jesus is the compassionate, merciful, com, uh, kind man, the one who's friends of everybody, not just the Jewish people, but of all people, specifically Luke's people, the Gentiles. And I think another aspect of why the gospel is so popular today is the connection with women that some of the, the marginalized members of the society at the time were women. Luke tells Theophilus that he carefully researched this, all these stories from the beginning, from the, those who were eyewitnesses. We know that Paul, when tracing out the we sections, we know that Paul was put into prison uh, for three years at Caesarea, that Luke was along at that point, or at least the we, we section continues up to that point, which means that Luke has three years to travel up and down the countryside, and we think that one of the, some of the people that he talked to were women. 
because as a Gentile doctor, he'd have both the psychological openness and the practical pr opportunity to be able to talk to them. The relationship between the sexes were much stricter in those days than in that culture than they are today. And just an ordinary man just could not go up to a woman and talk to a woman. It was just not done. I think but one of the interesting things that flows from the hat is that, the, 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 and it's so instructive for us today, is that he will parallel experiences. That's right. you, know, you got Simeon, but then you got mm -hmm. Anna. That's right. Right? And then you've, you've got, got, the, got a lost a sheep, sheep, and then you've got a woman uh, within the domestic setting finding the coin. That's correct. And, and so I believe he's given us exactly what we need today. That is, we don't need to stereotype men or women or fit them into molds that psychologists set for us. What we have to do is to take the, the experiences of both men and women women and take it seriously and see how God interacts in their lives and how they express it. And Luke's given us an exact model for doing it. That's right. Almost 50% of, of Luke's gospel is new material that only he has. And the implications are that, that by talking to the women, he got women's stories, things that they had remembered about Jesus. They were not part of the official repertory. And then he uses that in his gospel. He is very all the Gospels, of course, have some things, like the women are the ones who discover the tomb and things. But Luke makes the com points out that the women accompanied Jesus from Galilee on, traveled around with the disciples with him. Luke will uh, throw in for explicit mention that in Pentecost, for example, they were all gathered together, including Mary and mm -hmm. the women. That at the, in the, at the crucifixion scene, that there were people who were present included the women. It seems like he really, uh, and, and the example of the, the double um, hero and heroines of the parables and things are another example of that, he really seems to, to want us to keep in mind the, that, uh, that the women were an important part of Jesus' ministry. And when you look at the parts that are unique to Luke's gospel, some of the most beautiful passages of, of people's favorite passages of the gospel are found only in Luke. The shepherds in, at Bethlehem, for example, the, uh, the good, the good uh, thief, or the, I mean, yes, and the Zechariah, yes. and many of these others, I'm not saying right. very well. Well, then, um, Ken, we could talk on forever, and uh, we're passionate about Luke's gospel, and it speaks to women today. I think it speaks to charismatics, people who are interested in the spirit. It speaks to people who are feeling guilty about sin, uh, and people involved in social justice questions and so on. So there is, seems to be a distinctive message. And um, we've looked at Luke, and we see the compassionate Jesus, uh, the great prophet. And I like to say the best we have produced, that he, for the Gentile community, he says, here's the model of what humanity might be all about. Luke's gospel, a message for today, surely.